our view is that the recent run up in gold, which has been rather steady to the point of somewhat disturbing, um, is probably more about the developments of the BRICS countries in this upcoming meeting that Putin is hosting in Kazan, where it is rumored that an alternative to the U.S. dollar system and the U.S. Treasury as reserve asset system is going to be announced. I believe they're calling it, quote, the unit, which will be uh, apparently perhaps 40% backed by gold and the rest a basket of currencies among the BRICS countries. And this unit will be the, the medium of exchange and imbalances in trade will be settled. Um, so that if this happens, I think gold and the global market cap of gold needs to be much higher. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X and of course your host of this channel. And I'm looking forward to welcoming back the green chicken. Mr. Doomberg himself is joining us and I'm really looking forward to our discussions. Always nervous about the discussions because he knows so much more than I do, especially about the topics we're going to discuss because I always have to invite him on to, to discuss the energy markets, what is happening in the world, what's the energy situation look like. We need to talk oil price and uh, just very imminent, like as we're recording this on Tuesday... Tuesday. It is Tuesday, October 1st. Um, it seems like Iran is launching an attack on Israel here imminently. That's what the US officials have been reporting. So we will have to discuss that because oil is spiking right now. It's up over 3%. And uh, just the last five minutes, I've been watching the market. Uh, oil already shot up over a percent. So we will have to address this and the evolving situation. On top of this, we have to discuss China stimulus package, the Fed interest rate cut. How is it stimulating the, econ uh, the economy potentially? How is it impacting commodities? oil and others, of course, in particular. So with that said, please leave a comment, leave a like, and of course, subscribe to the channel. So thanks so much. Now, without much further ado, Doomberg, it is great to have you back on. Always look forward to this. Kai, great great to be back with you. It's been too long. Yeah, six months. Like we need to tighten that interval a little bit. <laughs> like it's, yeah. right, it's, uh, it's always too long. Uh, but time flies. It's ridiculous. It's October 1st as we're recording this. And uh, we, we have lots to discuss. And uh, I actually wanted to take the conversation a very different route. But just the last five minutes, I changed my mind. We need to talk about what's happening in the Middle East and how it's impacting markets. Do you, do you want to share your, your insights there? Like what, what's your current assessment of the situation? Well, I suppose we should begin by saying that this is a fast developing situation. And by the time we finish recording and more importantly, ultimately publish this podcast, um, things could be very different when we're dealing with a rapidly developing situation in real time. Um, the headlines that you referred to, of course, is it seems as though um, Iran is launching a counter strike against Israel for the various activities that the IDF has been up to, presumably in Lebanon. Um, hard to say the seriousness of uh, such an event. I I'm, I'm remember the last time this was rumored to be occurring, and it seemed to be a bit theatrical. Um, it was sort of a, a, a timid response meant to perhaps um, save some face domestically and, and, and do so in a way that didn't provoke a wider war. If this is a true um, you know, attempt to... Um, go to direct kinetic conflict with Israel, then all bets are off. Of course, this is a big game changer. And Iran uh, is a powerful country, uh, not one to be underestimated. And of course, there's always the shipping lanes in the Middle East, which can be interfered with. And if, if things escalate um, you know, a, as quickly as some fear, then we would be um, in the midst of a true energy crisis once again. Um, time will tell. I think we need to be careful to not run too far ahead of the news, but um, I'm looking at the same stretch you're looking at, and it's it's a pretty worrying situation. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, we, we might have to talk energy crisis. Like, what what do you mean by that term? Like, and, and I just want to provide a bit more context. Like, it seems like, or sorry, let me, like lots of thoughts, sorry, going through my head right now, because it is an evolving situation. But energy crisis means that we will lose access to, let's say, liquefied natural gas or oil in particular. Um, can you explain, elaborate on that? Yeah, oil would be the main worry. The world is swimming in cheap natural gas, and um, LNG shipping lanes have already mostly circumvented the Middle East. The Middle East, other than Qatar, I suppose, is, is not really a major natural gas producer. Um, the real issue is oil, and the, the proximate cause of a crisis would be um, disruption of shipping of oil out of the Middle East. Um, 
Oil, like other primary energy commodities, is highly inelastic, which means it does not take much in the way of changing supply in either direction to cause substantial uh, movements in price. So to give your listeners some context, um, the last time oil spiked you know, in the mid-120s in the aftermath of um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, President Joe Biden released one million barrels a day for six months from the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And that represented 1% of daily supply. And that incremental um, 1% of daily supply was a key reason why the price of oil was cut in half over the next six months. So it does not take much in the way of excess to cut the price. And conversely, it follows logically that it doesn't take much in the way of a shortage for for prices to skyrocket. And if there's a true sort of shutdown of the shipping lanes into and out of the Middle East, um, we would expect to see a world of hurt, just like small example. China could run short of supplies, which would affect a large part of global manufacturing. We're already dealing with the opening hours of a port strike uh, up and down the U.S. East Coast, which is throwing global logistics into uh, into a bit of a mess as well. So not a happy day um, to be <laughs> recording <laughs> with you, but that's that's what I mean by an energy crisis, predominantly a temporary period of um, a shortage of oil, which can drive prices exceptionally high. Maybe to follow up on that, and like based on a previous discussion we've had here, Dunberg, on the channel, I think, how much would that affect the US versus the EU? I think the EU would be way more affected by this energy crisis than than the U.S. Would that is that a correct assumption? Well, the the oil prices are currently set in global markets, and so the U.S. and Europe would presumably be subject to the same change in energy costs. However, the U.S. does have the option to limit exports, for example, and to protect the domestic market at the expense of regions like Europe unclear whether we're anywhere near that. And so I don't want anyone to misinterpret that as a prediction. But one of the reasons why you want to be energy independent is so that you have maximum flexibility to protect your domestic uh, concerns before worrying about the global markets. Now, it's a little more subtle than that. The US exports slightly more energy than it imports, but because of various specifications around how our um, refineries are built, they were built for heavy crude, and now we're producing an awful lot of light crude. Um, but still, on balance, you would rather be a net energy exporter during a time of crisis like this than a complete energy vassal like Europe. No, no, that makes sense because you want to take advantage of the high prices, of course. And uh, yeah. I'm curious, like how that play, how higher prices play everybody in their, in their hands. Like I'm thinking of Russia, for example, who could use higher prices uh, as well by selling to China, for example. So, well, Russia could also use a second front for the U.S. to be sending its weapons to, um, and so. Um, there's, you know, but nobody benefits from war. Um, I, no. I predict the Israelis will not benefit from war. The Iranians won't benefit from war, and and neither will the Americans. You know, war is the ultimate failure of diplomacy. That's a that's a really good point. We recorded an episode actually earlier today, Doomberg, with uh, Simon Hunt on on the topic of geopolitics alone and. At length, we discussed the situation in the Middle East, so I recommend everybody to watch that as well. I think we'll we'll publish the the, the geopolitic episode before our episode today, Dunberg. So um, I, I might link to that later um, as as well. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of interesting points, but uh, I want to stay on the oil price and use that opportunity to ask you about like oil price development. And we talked about that in the last episode, where I mentioned it's just like why isn't oil at uh, triple digits, given you know all the geopolitical tension, especially in the Middle East? And you correctly called it like. We were around seventy dollars at the time we last spoke. We're still at around seventy dollars, and uh, you actually advocate for lower prices uh, as well. And uh, Bloomberg just came out with a report that uh, forty dollars might be uh, in in the cards here again as well. Like, how, how does that all fit together, and what's your price prediction here for oil? Yeah, so we've been relatively bearish, certainly bearish calls that peak cheap oil are anywhere near the, uh, or on the horizon, um, or that the world was running out of oil. Um, one of the predictions that we made that has come true at a pace that is even quicker than we would have imagined is that with a plentiful and dirt cheap natural gas, which also happens to be cleaner burning, we are seeing uh, a wave of engine switching to take advantage of that energy arbitrage, particularly in China. Um, a fascinating article in Bloomberg uh, reported that new truck sales in China amounted to 30% uh, of those new truck sales were powered by uh, natural gas predominantly LNG engines, actually. And this was driven by both the relative abundance and cheapness of natural gas, but also 
the CCP's concern about pollution in the big cities. Um, diesel trucks emit far more particulate matter, for example, than clean burning natural gas trucks do. And um, estimates vary, but I saw, I believe Goldman Sachs um, analyzed that approximately half a million barrels a day of diesel was being displaced through a combination of engine switching in uh, long haul trucking, as well as in the cargo uh, container ship industry. Um, we're seeing new LNG powered um, railroads, for example, to transport electric vehicles. Uh, BYD, I believe, has charted their own. So we're seeing this switch happen. And it, because of this inelasticity that we talked about earlier, it doesn't take much in the way of switching for um, for prices to harmonize. And, and in fact, we would argue and have argued that OPEC is keeping the price of oil artificially high. That's what cartels do. And because natural gas is co-produced in the Permian, um, we're getting this this tsunami of natural gas, especially in the U.S., which is, you know, a, a very fine fuel, a clean burning fuel. It has its handling issues, but those can be overcome. And once the engines are switched, that demand is basically lost um, forever. And in the long run, it is our view uh, that all hydrocarbons will trade based on their energy price, uh, correcting for logistics. And that massive arbitrage is like we have seen in the North American natural gas oil spread. Um, can't persist forever, and they don't. So this is what the economy does. Um, the economy is a massive deflationary machine. And so you have these tailwinds to the equilibrium price of oil, um, which is relatively easy to calculate. The equilibrium price of oil, in our view, is roughly around 55 to $60 a barrel. I'm happy to explain how we get to that number. Uh, it could go below that. It could, could stay elevated if we have a big war in the Middle East. I mean, you could see $200 oil. So Interesting. Yeah, no. Um, do, why don't you elaborate real quick? Like, how do you get to that point without getting too technical? Of sure. course, but I'm curious. Because sure. I've referenced your your forecast quite a few times in my interviews uh, in the past. So I'm curious. I, I need to sort of back up my, my thesis that I'm stealing from you, of course. So. <laughs> sure. I'll just give you what. Look, when I say equilibrium price, that's not a prediction. That's where we believe the price of oil would naturally trade. Um, all else being equal, and all else is never equal. But it's interesting to know directionally what should happen, so that if things remain calm, you could at least have like, um, it's kind of like having a compass, right? It points you in the right direction. So um, the first thing that you have to know is that a barrel of oil has approximately 5.8 million BTUs of energy in it. And uh, the break-even price for natural gas in the US, we believe, like dry gas drillers in Appalachia, is probably around $4 a million BTU. Um, so if you multiply that by 5.8, that tells you what natural gas is trading for in the U.S. on an oil of you know barrel of oil content basis. So um, if you take this four dollar, um, when I say break even price, sorry, it, at four dollars a million BTU in the U.S., um, drillers can totally earn their cost of capital. The break even price is about 250. You know, um, all of these companies need to return uh, investments to their uh, shareholders, and so let's just call it four dollars a million BTU is the profit profitable. A happy place for natural gas in the U.S. You add six dollars per million BTU for LNG chilling and shipping, and you could land LNG in Europe at ten dollars uh, a million BTU. And you multiply ten by five point eight, and you get fifty-eight dollar oil. Uh, right. And if you look at the price of Brent and landed LNG times five point eight in Europe, um, they were roughly in equilibrium for the past month. Of course, with oil now spiking on this news, who knows where where they'll end up? But that's a, a sort of a rule of thumb. You just take whatever landed LNG is in either Asia and Europe multiplied by 5.8, and that's roughly where um, where oil should trade. And in fact, when oil was trading much higher than the landed LNG price times 5.8, we ascribed that gap to um, geopolitical risk. And interestingly, uh, up until yesterday, the market was pricing up no geopolitical risk, and yet here we have allegedly ballistic missiles being fired into Israel by, by Iran. So it tells you uh, sometimes the market isn't always right. Yeah, no, it's true. And uh, I think we still need we, we need to talk about like, what is the market currently pricing in into everything? And we'll, we'll break that down a little bit because gold is another interesting um, or another interesting intersection, in my opinion, not not really sure where it's going to head and what is priced in right now. And we'll, we'll get to that. Um, Doomberg, let, let, let's switch uh, gears a little bit. Let's let's get back to the my original script here. And because I need I need to talk to you about uh, the impact of the China stimulus and the Fed rate cuts on the global economy. And my opening question was going to be like, how fragile is the global economy right now, given what I just mentioned? So the you know, trying to understand what what's happening inside of China, uh, not living there is very challenging, especially for Western analysts like you and I who don't speak the language and 
it's impossible to really say. It's always been a bit of a black box of government statistics, for example, which nobody really quite believes. Um, but the, all things being equal, a giant bazooka of stimulus from China will stimulate. Um, I think that's pretty straightforward. That is bullish for Chinese equities in particular, which seems to have caught a few large uh, uh, investors off sides and it seemed to be a bit of a short squeeze going on. Um, it's bullish for commodities because China is the largest importer of oil and a huge importer of natural gas and one of the largest refiners uh, of oil uh, in the world. And so it's bullish for all those things. Um, it's bullish for gold because they're basically printing currency. And, and um, so you know, all things being equal, it's incredibly bullish. Um, and you know, Xi Jinping has decided that he wants the numbers to go up. And so the numbers will go up. Is, is it more about uh, stabilizing the economy or actively stimulating it so it grows even further? Because I think GDP forecast or the current stimulus package is only forecasted to add like 0.5% to the Chinese GDP. Like, what, what, what's the goal? Just stimulate and or um, stabilize? I mean, the purpose of a thing is what it does, right? And so the day before we learned of this bazooka, we had an assessment of the economy. And whatever your assessment of the global economy was the day before uh, needs to be rounded up the day after. Um, the degree to which the absolute um, stimulus matters to you more than say the shift in uh, mindset and outlook, uh, which can be self-fulfilling as well. If everyone assumes that everyone else assumes that money, the money machine is rolling again, then you could see stocks get ahead of themselves. And we saw that a little bit uh, in the US here recently. Uh, again, as, as we're sitting here and Bitcoin is dropping and oil is spiking for the headlines that we're seeing. I mean, that, that radically changes the impact of that stimulus, but all things being equal, numbers go up. You know, when the governments want the numbers to go up, it's not that hard. I look what the Fed did after the COVID uh, pandemic. Well, how how is the U.S. different than China right now? Like China is actively throwing money at the problem right now while the U.S. is just cutting. Um, I'd say there's a U.S. Uh, presidential election looming, so giving out lots of cash, probably not the best idea um, right now. So I'm curious, like, Globally, like China, of course, a massive impact on, on the commodities, as you pointed out correctly here. And uh, the U.S. is like, how far behind is it behind China? Are, once oh. the elections are done, are we going to see another stimulus package? Oh, no. okay. We, we are stimulating like crazy over here. We have uh, we're running massive federal okay. deficits, which is very stimulative. <laughs> um, we are paying out a trillion dollars a year in interest, which is basically stimmies for rich people. Um, <laughs> Janet, Janet Yellen. Well, it's true, right? I mean, so like wealthy investors are getting four or 5% on their money, that money is recirculating in the economy. It might not have the same velocity as uh, stimulus checks to the, to the average uh, worker do, but they're still stimulative. And Janet Yellen has been doing all manner of stealth stimmies as well. Um, subtle nuances that are a little bit difficult to explain, but um, the entirety of Washington DC is, is harmonized and organized around keeping the orange man out of the Oval Office and anything they can do to prop up the numbers is being done. Um, I mean, we're adding a trillion dollars in debt every 90 days. Uh, that's that's stimulative. And so just because um, a bazooka hasn't been directly pulled out doesn't mean that the machine guns aren't still firing. Yeah, it hasn't been labeled that. And that's sort of what I meant, I think, in sure. a complicated way. Like, it hasn't been labeled a stimulus package. And it's not like an infrastructure. What would, no, sorry, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, of course, that, that was a label that was used uh, a while ago. But uh, that it hasn't been labeled in, in 2024. In October 2024, there is no label for the current deficit spending, I guess. So, yeah, that's I mean, it, I it's truly, saying. it's truly remarkable. And look, I mean, the US government is 25% of. GDP spend and it's up 6% year over year. So that means even if the rest of the economy was zero growth, we'd still have plus 1.5% economic expansion just based on government largesse alone. Now, how how um, sustainable this all is, of course, um, is a separate question. But the, from a flow perspective, the US is stimulating financial conditions are easy. And on top of that, the Fed is cutting. I mean, if you would have asked me to predict when the Fed would cut rates back in January, I would say, you know, a month and a half before the election. Um, the Fed is extremely political. They're they are united in their objective of, of seeing Paris um, elected, and they're doing everything they can to make, make it happen. Inter yeah, interesting. You, you just mentioned something I would really want to follow up on. So U.S. is roughly, or U.S. government, sorry, is 1.5% of the overall GDP. So in no, the U.S. 25, we, 25, yeah. So. Uh, uh, sorry, like we were talking growth. That, sorry, yes. GDP growth. So, and we we were sitting at three percent. So the U.S. is actually, if you take government out, because it's not really adding any value, um, 
on on the books here, like government spending in that sense. You were saying the U.S. is actually growing only one point five percent on a, if you take government out of the equation. But you really right? can't because government employees buy cars, and all the spending of the government ends up in a corporation somewhere or um, in somebody's pockets. Um, the private sector benefits greatly from public sector spending. I mean, just look at the the Boeings and the Lockheeds of the world. I mean, the, the money that we're quote unquote giving to Ukraine is not going to Ukraine. It's staying right here and it's paying the salaries and the bonuses and the stock buybacks of Lockheed Martin and Boeing and the rest of the military uh, supplier base. And so um, I, I don't think it's, it's you can't ignore the government. It, and in fact, put it this way, if, if, if we suddenly decided to get serious about um, fiscal discipline, we would probably enter a recession. I mean, I, I think it, you know, if the government can stimulate, it can also stifle. And those are political choices. And one of the reasons why um, it is dangerous to go down these roads is because it's never politically popular to stifle. And so you end up in a doom loop of sort of hyperinflationary spiral, which it, nobody's calling for that in the US because we have the reserve currency and other significant advantages. But um, this is how emerging markets um, behave. And by the way, we should say a disturbingly high uh, proportion of the debt outstanding is in short-term bonds and even bills, which is the stuff of emerging market debt crises. But because we're the U.S. and it's the largest you know economy in the world, and it has the printing press and it has uh, the reserve currency, nobody sort of uses that framework to analyze. Well, few people use that framework to analyze what's going on. So, but I, we had made a call earlier this year called Slick Landing, where we said the combination of dirt cheap natural gas and extensive fiscal stimulus would allow the U.S. to avoid a recession. That was a bit of a controversial call. And we said, at least until the election, looks like we're going to get to the election with nominal you know, or reasonable growth of 2 or 3%. Um, and so a recession has been largely avoided. Now, some people don't believe the government numbers and they think everything is fake. And it's hard to debate such uh, counters. But you, you know, looking at the numbers we have, um, I don't think that we're in the middle of a recession. Um, and so that that's... Our view, that was our view. We put it under our masthead. And, and I think that the piece has played out pretty well. Yeah, let, let's elaborate on that recession topic, because I think it's an important one, because people have been predicting a recession for the last two years. And uh, yet here we are, at least no official label has been slapped on it. Um, so, you, so you're saying we're not in a recession right now, the, the numbers are fine, like it looks okay. But do, do you see one looming down the road, like post election? Is there something that blow up might blow off the lid here? Well, so we it should be important to say uh, we got it wrong too. We expected that if Powell was going to hike rates, you know, from zero to five percent in a fortnight, that that would trigger economic headwinds that would probably lead to a recession. And it was when a recession was failing to materialize that caused us, as analysts, not advocates, to take a step back and think about what it is that we might have gotten wrong. And the two things that we got wrong was just the extent of the fiscal stimulus and the complete lack of discipline, even among the Republicans in Washington. But more importantly. Um, natural gas is critical to the U.S. economy. Unlike other petro states, the U.S. has a very sophisticated downstream manufacturing sector still that can take advantage of dirt cheap energy. Um, there are hundreds of cogeneration facilities that are powering heavy industry in the U.S. A cogeneration facility burns typically natural gas and produces both industrial grade steam and electricity simultaneously uh, with very high efficiencies. And all of those cogen facilities feeding those heavy manufacturing plants were at a globally significant advantage. Um, natural gas was negative in big parts of the U.S. for long periods of time this spring. Um, when you have dirt cheap natural gas, when you're swimming in excess hydrocarbons and the government is stimulating, that's not a recipe that bakes a recession. And so we will, of course, eventually have a recession. Business cycles are cyclical. It's right in the name. And so, uh, but we just didn't think that there would be one before the election, especially when you factored in the fact that the establishment parties in D.C., which we would count both mainstream Republicans and Democrats in that same camp, um, they're united with one objective, which is to make the numbers go up until November. Um, and so we thought that they would succeed. And that we again, we wrote that piece called Slick Landing. Instead of soft landing or hard landing, we, we, we pointed out that dirt cheap natural gas is very bullish for economic growth. Well, cheap energy is overall the, the main driver for growth overall, like... Yeah. Which brings me to Europe, because we don't have cheap energy, at least not anymore, and there's zero economic growth. Looking Correct. at Germany, uh, we're actually declining. I think we just revised our GDP uh, forecast. I was I was going to call it growth forecast, but it's not a growth forecast because it's going to be negative 0.1%. So yes. um, it's not a... Right? Um, 
let's let's compare the US and Europe for a second here, because I've been often faulted, by the way, on this channel that we don't talk about the EU enough and uh, the European uh, economies here. Um, let, let's contrast that. Like, it seems like the US maybe is getting away with a recession here, at least for now, while it seems Europe is in the middle of one, uh, looking at uh, what, what I'm seeing in Germany, for example. Would you, would you agree with that? And what's your assessment here? Yeah, uh, we just wrote a piece earlier this this month called um, Judgment Day, where we Lamb, had, some, had some fun lampooning Mario Draghi's uh, homework assignment from Ursula von der Leyen. Um, we pointed out in that piece um, all you really need to know about what's going on in Europe. Um, the European Union, which notably excludes um, Norway and the UK, at least the numbers I'm about to quote exclude those two countries, um, the European Union consumes about 11% of the world's oil and 8% of its natural gas. And in contrast, it produces just 0.5% of the world's oil and 0.9% of the world's natural gas. And that's, you know, that was fine when, you know, there were ample supplies of crude and distilled products and pipeline natural gas from Russia at favorable prices and pretty good reliability, but they, they don't have that anymore. And so, as we said in the piece, there you have it. Um, now, to be sure, the European Union has done its level best to make things worse by forcing the uh, the deployment of intermittent renewable energy onto the various grids and proactively shutting down their nuclear power plants, especially in Germany. None of that is helpful, but the root cause of Europe's challenges um, are that it doesn't produce its own energy. Um, it, it's basically dependent upon other nations. And so when we have price spikes like this, as you alluded to earlier, Europe is amongst the early victims. Um, and they will not solve this problem. You know, they're talking about artificial intelligence. I mean, they're not going to do anything on AI. They can't. Uh, what's going to power their data centers? The U.S. has dirt cheap natural gas, and uh, the technology companies are salivating to gorge on it. And they're also restarting nuclear power plants here. The Three Mile Island announcement was really a historic milestone in our view. Um, the U.S. will dominate AI. China will dominate AI. And Europe will continue to, you know, uh, further away. Now, really interesting comments. Of course, lots of follow-up questions. We're way behind the AI race in in Europe. Like, I don't think we have anybody that's somewhat competitive. But uh, Sweden was one country that stood out to me. Like they have really cheap energy over there as well. They have hydro and they have nuclear, right? Um, but I have to ask you, like, is Germany ever going to restart its nuclear reactors? It seems like there is a bit of a momentum change happening. Well, we would need a political change of epic proportions, and I think the traffic light coalition is on its final legs, uh, one would assume, um, given the outcome of the various regional elections and the responses to those outcomes. Uh, I don't know how the Green Party is in charge of anything at the moment in Germany after their historic wipeouts in these regional elections. And if an election were held today, one wonders how they would do. Um, but given the fact that the sort of most popular party in the former East German states is um, unacceptable to to be partnered with in any form of a coalition. It's unclear whether a, a government can even be formed if an election were held today, because um, the parties that would have to unite seem incompatible with each other. So um, I suspect that, uh, we suspect that if a, a sea change occurred in German politics, the right thing to do would be to begin to reopen those nuclear plants. Some of them have been sabotaged, uh, sorry, decommissioned, um, to the point where that might not be technically feasible. Um, but one wonders, um, you know, the Germans are very good at engineering, and if they put their minds to something, they can be quite effective at it. And, um, so we, we would certainly hope for their own sake. You know, as we said in the piece, like, unless and until Europe reconciles with Russia, and we have no idea how that is supposed to happen, but just objectively, unless and until um, Europe reconciles with Russia and begins exploring and producing its own fossil fuels in earnest and begins a continent-wide build-out of nuclear reactors as fast as they can, they're going to be stuck in this doom loop. They don't, you cannot, let's put the energy vassals are incapable of projecting power uh, for very long and Europe doesn't produce its own power. And so that's very simple now. It's like, like Norway is a very strong country, but it's a small country and they're not in the EU, but they're energy sufficient. And even the UK drills a little bit of oil still in the North Sea, but it too is not in the UK. If you isolate Sorry, it too is not in the European Union. If you isolate the, the countries that are members of the European Union, find me an energy power in there. No, uh, it's France's nuclear is, is about the only exception, and they're trying their best to ruin that. So, um, yeah, yeah. 
No, I just looked up. Like we always have like a, a poll in in Germany every Sunday, and uh, right now the SPD, Green Party, and the FDP, so the three um, traffic light parties, they'll get up uh, to what is it, thirty one percent at best, and yeah. uh, the Green Party's down to ten percent, which is uh, they've they've lost over five percent since the last election. It's looking abysmal out there. Um, yeah, how's the how's the AfD polling in that? Just curious. Seventeen uh, percent. National. So yeah. 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 That's that's all national. Yeah. If if tomorrow was an election, that's what it would look like. So yeah. that was the last polling is actually from today. So really, really interesting. And I'm quite embarrassed, quite honestly, about what is happening and uh, how we are ruining our country. Personally, I'm thinking like, or I'm hoping, hoping, really, fingers crossed that the Volkswagen debacle is waking people up. And it seems like it is, but not in a way that I, I'm hoping. Like, it might take longer for people to wake up. It seems like they're hitting the snooze button. Yeah, uh, the Chinese are going to dominate the auto sector, um, and the German automakers have been wise to form deep partnerships in that country, but um, it's going to be very, very difficult to produce vehicles in Germany or any other part of Europe, um, especially with this sort of forced mandate towards the sunsetting of internal combustion engines. And China is so far ahead in the, in the construction of electric vehicles that there's basically no hope for the Western automakers, in our view. Um, the BYD vehicles coming out of those factories are just stunning. And they're also amazingly cost effective. And this is this these the Volkswagens and the Fords and the GMs of the world are capitalized to compete globally, but the global south is going to happily take a fifteen thousand dollar BYD plug in hybrid that gets, you know, two thousand kilometers on a single full charge and a full gas tank. I mean, this is just undeniable value. And uh, they will lap it up. And and so yeah, I don't I don't see how it can be avoided. I the, the least surprising headline of the year was the Volkswagen fiasco. No, very predictive. Like we we ran, uh, what do you call it when you fall on a sword? Knowingly fall, fall on a sword. Yeah, right? that's exactly what happened. We could everybody could forecast that quite literally. Yeah. Self and you know, self impalement. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm um, doing. I have to ask you two more questions real quick about commodities. Um, and and the question more or less is what is priced in right now? And that's gold and copper. Um, let, let's start with gold. Like what what is priced in the gold price right now? Like we talked geopolitics, of course, but uh, we need to talk stimulus. We need to talk Fed rate cut. And really curious what your take there is. Uh, our view is that the recent run up in gold, which has been rather steady to the point of somewhat disturbing, um, is probably more about the developments of the BRICS countries in this upcoming meeting that Putin is hosting in Kazan where it is rumored that an alternative to the US dollar system and the US Treasury as reserve asset system is going to be announced. Um, I believe they're calling it, quote, the unit, which will be uh, apparently perhaps 40% backed by gold and the rest a basket of currencies among the BRICS countries. And this unit will be the, the medium of exchange and imbalances in trade will be settled. Um, so that if this happens, I think gold and the global market cap of gold needs to be much higher. Um, this is a, a bull thesis of many people who own gold, that it will eventually reassert its proper position as a neutral reserve asset in the settlement of global trade imbalances. Um, a giant step towards that in Kazan later this month would, would explain, in our view, the risk-adjusted nature of the recent run-up in gold. Um, I don't think gold is really trading on stimulus and all this other stuff because it's kind of baked in everybody knows that these currencies are debasing themselves um i think the step change in gold price is probably more um hedging against this development and gold price needing to go much higher even from here interesting no it's um it, it's interesting that you bring up the BRICS meeting because I, I don't know i feel like i've been burned last year talking about the BRICS meeting in johannesburg where nothing happened in terms of currency discussions uh the only thing that happened was that it was postponed and nobody talked about it. <laughs> and uh, now it's apparently on the official agenda in, in Kazan. And uh, the Petro one comes to mind there as well. Um, I've been doing a little research prior uh, or this morning in, in that regard, um, where China is obviously trying to replace the U.S. dollar for international trade outside the SWIFT system. So Yeah, China and Russia. And um, so we wrote a piece predicting that there may be a, a sad surprise in store for those hoping for such an outcome similar to the Johannesburg meeting, that perhaps Brazil might scuttle the effort and Lula might be sort of uh, uh, not as he seems. So it was a little bit of a speculative piece that we wrote um, called Neighborhood Watch. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. Uh, we'll be watching with interest. I mean, we're not party to the inner discussions. You know, the thought is that this would all be done on some central bank digital currency setup and, um, you know, on the blockchain. And 
and it was a little bit for everybody involved in this, in the speculation <laughs> running up to this meeting. Um, but we shall see. I, I, I have no real other explanation for the the steady rise in gold that we've seen this year. The, buy, the buying has been relentless. I mean, it's just yeah, like Saudi Arabia bought 160 yeah. tons of gold the other day from Switzerland. Yeah, well, all That's... the countries that would be necessary to participate in some kind of post-dollar world are seemingly accumulating gold, um, which is an interesting tell. No. It's always hard to say, um, but I, again, I, I would say in the U.S., the upcoming Kazan meeting is hardly reported on at all. Uh, nobody, you know, one of the reasons we wrote about it, um, even if it was a bit of a speculative piece, was just to let our subscribers know that this meeting was even on the books uh, and that it would be coming. And so this is meant to be, uh, according to the gold bugs, this is meant to be Putin's great trump card that he's going to play. And um, he will liberate the global south from the shackles of the U.S. dollar system. Um, so we shall see. Um, it, it, history is going to be made one way or the other. I mean, we are at a very precarious time with hot wars in uh, on Europe's doorstep and a seemingly a hot war in the Middle East with rising tensions in, in, with China and Taiwan. So it's a very dangerous time, precarious time. Um, and, and we'll have to see what happens. But I mean, Kazan is not on anybody's radar over here. I don't know if it's getting much in the way of press conference in Europe. No, not really. Like you really have to dig for it, I have to admit. Yeah, same here. You can find yeah. it in the alternative media, right? I mean, if you go to Zero Hedge and you can read yeah. about it there, but um, it's not like you're reading about it in the Wall Street Journal or, or the Washington Post or the New York Times or Time Magazine. I've, but I've noticed that with the gold price in general, that is not yeah. being discussed. Like even when it made all-time highs and touched $2,700, I think it was a small headline on CNBC. It was widely ignored. That's great. I mean, I, I would have sold a lot more than I did. Uh, I took a little off uh, after the rate cut just because I had, my position had grown to be uncomfortably large and now it's just um slightly annoyingly large but um but i still have a very large position of gold i should say in full disclosure uh, i don't think i can move the price of gold so it's not like i'm talking my book but uh, we do own a lot of gold that's one of the few things i do own that, that we might write about occasionally yeah uh, i do make very last question i do have to ask you about copper while i have you um where, where do you see it trending i'm a bit surprised by the rally but then again china stimulus was announced in the middle of the rally actually so i'm curious where do you think copper is going yeah, copper is a very difficult metal to forecast. I think you had Simon Hunt on, who's far better uh, educated on the subject matter than we are. I, I would say the interesting thing about the price of copper just zooming out for the past five years is it doesn't really look like a chart that predicts the electrification of everything is coming soon. It has rallied recently, but it's not like it is you know, uh, off the charts uh, or doing anything particularly special. If we were truly going to uh, run the world on electricity, you would expect copper to be far higher than where it is today, especially given the paucity of, of high, high concentration mines uh, in the portfolio of, of projects to be developed. There just aren't that many. Um, you can count on one hand the sort of significant developing mines in the world. Um, and so the price of copper actually we think is relatively modest compared to um, sort of the, the climate hysteria that we've experienced in the past decade. No, ab absolutely. Um, maybe to add some more, I don't know, bearish sentiment here to the copper price. Andy Holm, who we've had on this channel before, he's a Reuters columnist, uh, really fantastic on base metals, commodities in particular. He, he published an article yesterday summarizing a report from a study group that has a sobering message for the copper bulls. That, that's the title. But there's enough copper for the next few years. We don't have to worry about a supply crunch at all. So Yeah, that, that probably would be our view, I think. Um, again, back to this whole concept, like if, if we were truly going to ban internal combustion engines, I mean, the, the amount of copper in an electric vehicle far outweighs the amount of copper in a standard vehicle. And if we're going to be building out all of this uh, electricity infrastructure and, uh, you know, we would be seeing copper at uh, two times the price that it is today. So that it isn't tells us, we think that, you know, the copper market never really believed the renewable hype. Um, so, it, you know, I, I think... If, if, if we're not going to be doing, and I don't think we will, anything meaningful uh, in the renewable energy sector, if we've kind of punched ourselves out on that and reached peak uh, uh, ESG, then um, I think the copper market is fairly priced. Peak ESG, I might steal that term. I like that. Peak ESG. Fantastic. You, you can have it. <laughs> awesome. Um, Thunberg, what a wonderful conversation, as always, with you. Um, I always learned so much. You might have noticed my questions. I've been stumbling over myself a little bit, but uh, it's because I'm so processing so much in my head as well while you're talking. It's fantastic. Um, you, you got the domain down there. You write the number one Substack newsletter in, in finance. Um, where can we find it? Like, it's, I don't yeah. think. <laughs> Just uh, Thunberg.com. We, we bought the domain name, and so we're proud owners of our own website now. We're still, of course, on Substack, but Thunberg.com is how you find everything. 
Kai, uh, let's not make it six months between the next appearance. Always okay. enjoyed talking to you. And maybe the next time we get together, we'll have something more pleasant to talk about. Than, yeah, we yeah. always talk about like when there's a massive geopolit geopolitical event happening. I remember one time we recorded October 8th or something like that. Yeah, well, between like, now and the next recording, I'm going to run out and stock up on toilet paper to, uh, to hedge against this uh, port strike that we're having in the U.S. right now, too, on the same day. Yeah, I saw the hysteria on social media about that. So <laughs> I haven't made it to the store yet. I might have to. So Luckily, I'm a prepper, so I'm in good shape. <laughs> awesome. No, I appreciate it. Doomberg, thank you so much for your time. Always appreciate talking with you and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this was insightful as much for you as it was for me. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. I know 75 to 80% of you watching are not subscribed. Please, it helps us gain a wider audience, of course, bring guests like Doomberg on regularly as well. And uh, just ask some smart questions because we take, we, we read the comment. I read all the comments, not really healthy sometimes, but I do. And uh, we, we're trying to incorporate that in our interviews. So it's, we're, we're trying to create something that you can get something out of it. That's the whole point. We're trying to educate and to make you a smarter and better investor. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more. Happy Sunday.